All right, kiddos, and welcome back. We're going to continue our discussion related to the atomic theory. If you remember, before we talked about the mole concept, and we took a little bit of a break from the atomic theory, before we talked about the mole concept, we talked about a dude named Ernest Rutherford, and he discovered that most of the mass of the atom was concentrated in a very, very dense core. Do you remember what he called that? That's right, he called that the nucleus of the atom and it was positively charged and almost all of the mass of the atom was in that tiny little spot. Where were the electrons? Yeah, they were outside somewhere. He wasn't quite sure how they orbited the nucleus. He just knew that they were outside of the nucleus, buzzing around somehow. Um, and he pretty much left it at that. Now, in this particular section of our notes on the atomic theory, we're going to actually focus our attention on the behavior of electrons as they are buzzing around that nucleus. Now, before we can do that, we need to understand a little bit about the nature of light. So, we're going to take a little diversion. And as part of that diversion, I want to show you a little bit of a demonstration. What I'm going to do in this demonstration is I'm going to take some salts. Salts are simply ionic compounds. I have one of sodium, copper, lithium, strontium, and potassium. I believe they're all chlorides or nitrates. And I'm going to dissolve those salts separately in some water. And then I'm going to add some methanol to that. Now, the reason I add methanol is because it burns with a fairly colorless flame. So when I burn that methanol, it's going to heat those salts up and excite those atoms in some manner, and they will give off different colored lights. Now, we really didn't know what that light was caused by. We just knew that each metal gave off a characteristic color. So let me show you that video for right now, and then we're going to come back to our notes. Alrighty? So from left to right, we have lithium, strontium, copper, potassium, and finally sodium. Those are all salts of those, of those metals. Alrighty, now welcome back. Wasn't that interesting? Yeah, if, if you think about fireworks that you might watch on Independence Day, the 4th of July, when you see a green firework, you know what element's in there now, don't you? When you see a pink one, you know what element's in there, or a nice yellow-orange one. You know what elements are inside that firework. We mix that element with the gunpowder, and when it explodes, obviously excites those atoms and causes them to give off that color. Now, once again, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to answer the question as, uh, for you right now as to what causes that color. I do want to talk, though, about what what different colored light is, the nature of light. And so to do that, we need to talk about two variables that are related to a beam of light. Those variables are wavelength, which we symbolize with the Greek letter lambda. Sort of kind of looks like an upside down Y, doesn't it? And frequency, which we symbolize with the Greek letter nu. And that sort of kind of looks like a fancy V, or maybe like a seagull you used to draw in your primitive artwork back in elementary school. So wavelength and frequency are two variables that are related to a beam of light. Let me talk first about wavelength. Wavelength is simply defined as the distance between two similar points on adjacent waves. So let's take the crest of this wave right here. And if I were to measure the crest of this wave, the distance to the crest of the next, or the next crest on the adjacent wave, that distance would be my wavelength. And the SI unit for length is the meter, so we measure that distance in meter. However, we're often going to convert that to nanometers in this section of our notes. Now, it doesn't have to be from crest to crest. Notice if I go from trough to trough, that distance is going to be the same as the distance from crest to crest. So it's simply the distance between two similar points on adjacent waves. Now, what is frequency? Well, let me show you a couple of different ways to help you guys understand frequency. Here are two waves, one with a long wavelength and one with a short wavelength. Notice the distance between the two crests here is longer than the distance between the two crests here. Frequency is the number of wave cycles that are completed per unit time. 
often that unit of time is the second. So we would say number of wave cycles per second. Now that's known as the Hertz. Perhaps you've heard of that. Mathematically, we often omit the term cycles and we call it a one over second. Or you can also write it as seconds to the negative first. These are all units that we will use for, for frequency. Cycles per second, hertz, one over seconds or seconds to the negative first. Well, let's go back to this drawing here. Now, when I have a long wavelength, do you see that I complete fewer wave cycles per unit time? Let's say that this line represents a time. We'll start at zero seconds and we'll end up at one second, okay? Let's see how many wave cycles this first wave completes in a second. So we're gonna start here and we're gonna go ahead and complete that cycle that takes me right to here. So there's one cycle, two cycles, three cycles. It looks like four wave cycles per second. So I'm gonna say four seconds to the negative first. That means four cycles per second. That's with the long wavelength. Let's take a look at the shorter wavelength. You see the distance between those two crests is shorter. Let's count how many wave cycles I complete in that same period of time. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven seconds to the negative first. So here's a profundity profundity. When the wavelength gets shorter, do you notice the frequency gets higher? Yeah, that's very, very profound. I'm going to say that again. When the wavelength gets shorter, the frequency gets higher. Maybe you'd like me to say that in a different way. How about this? As the wavelength gets longer, doesn't the frequency get shorter or smaller? And it turns out that when the frequency increases, that wave has more energy. So the higher the frequency, the higher the energy. The higher the frequency, the higher the energy, the shorter the wavelength. Think about that. We're going to come back to that and talk, that, talk about that uh, several more times. So let's do some math with this. If I were to take wavelength, lambda, and multiply it by frequency, nu, and I were just to inspect the units, lambda is the unit meter, Nu is the frequency one over seconds, or cycles per second. We usually omit the term cycles and just replace it with a one. If we multiply these two together, do you notice that meters or seconds do not cancel out? I end up with a new unit, a derived unit, meters per second. And that unit is a velocity. Now we're talking about light here. We're talking about the wavelength and frequency of light all light, in fact all electromagnetic radiation for that matter, travels at the same velocity. It is a constant. It is 3.00 times 10 to the 8th meters every second. That is the velocity of light constant. And it's abbreviated with the small letter c. So we can rewrite this equation as lambda times nu equals c. And that c is the velocity of light and that is equal to 3.00 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Now, let's play around a little bit with that equation. If the velocity of light is wavelength times frequency, what if I wanted to say it, solve for wavelength, lambda? What would I do with frequency? That's right, you've all completed pre-algebra. You'd bring this frequency symbol to the other side, wouldn't you, and divide by it. So wavelength would be equal to c divided by the frequency. So if I know the speed of light, which I do, remember it is a constant. You always know the speed of light. If I know the frequency of that light, I can solve for the wavelength. And likewise, what if I wanted to solve for frequency? Wouldn't I bring lambda to the other side? So frequency would be C divided by lambda? You bet. So I always know C. Once again, it's a constant. If I know the wavelength of that light, I can solve for its frequency. So the important thing here is, if I know one of the variables, frequency or wavelength, we can always find the other. Now I want to practice doing that, but before I do that, I want to talk about the electromagnetic spectrum. Perhaps you've seen this before. 
This colorful part on top is called the visible spectrum. It makes up a very, very small part of the entire electromagnetic spectrum. It makes up the electromagnetic energy that our eyes can actually detect or see. It can detect wavelengths between 400, and that's violet light, nanometers, to 700 nanometers, and that's red light. Which of these two lights has the higher frequency? Think about it. That's right, if you said 400 nanometers has the higher frequency, you're absolutely correct. You remembered that the shorter the wavelength, like we talked about up here, the shorter the wavelength, the higher the frequency. So this stuff over here, the violet light has high frequency. If you remember, that's going to be more energy, by the way. And the red light over here, the stuff on this side, has a lower frequency, big distance between waves, and it turns out to be a lower energy. Well, let's continue to look at this, because besides the visible spectrum, there's more to the electromagnetic radiation than what we can actually see. If I look to the right, you notice I get to ultraviolet and x-rays and gamma rays, and the wavelength gets smaller and smaller and smaller, 10 to the negative eighth, tenth, negative twelfth, negative fourteenth meters. As that gets smaller, notice the frequency gets higher. 10 to the 16th, 10 to the 18th, 10 to the 20th, and 10 to the 22nd. And as a result, the energy gets higher as well. Take a look to the left now. We look to the left, you notice the wavelength gets bigger. We have 10 to the negative 4th, negative 2nd, 10 to the 0, 10 to the 2nd, 10 to the 4th. Bigger and bigger wavelengths. And when that happens, notice the frequency gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And as a result, the energy gets smaller as well. Okay. Now, when we come back, we're going to practice using these equations. And we're going to solve some problems where I'm going to give you either frequency or wavelength, and you're going to solve for the one that's missing. Okay. Let's take a quick look at that on the next page. It says, what is the frequency of light? So I'm asking for frequency, and I'm going to give you wavelength. And then the second one, I want to know the wavelength, and I'm going to give you the frequency. So we'll play around with those questions on our next video. See you soon. Bye-bye.